I think it's John. Is it John Valentine Brothers? Can't keep these damn guitarists straight. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. Susie and the Banshees Week, brought to you by our patrons over on Patreon. This is a Patreon selection. We do one of those a month. We have a poll based on uh, requests from the patrons, and then they vote. And this is what we got this month. Uh, special shout out to Rich, big in our community. He is a big Susie Stan, and I think he helped uh, to get him over the finish line. This one's for you, Rich. Just like majority whip in there, just getting everyone in line to vote for Susie, pretty much, to be honest. Which goes to show you that it is possible. If you really want to see somebody, get on the Patreon and you can make it happen. You can make your dreams come true. Uh, so check it out. Links in the description. But uh, man, going into this one, I got to say, this is one of the artists that I am the least familiar with going in. Um, if you're new to the channel, we cover a different artist every week, do a full discography. We rank their albums, give you top 10 songs. Then we have a third discussion video. And, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Some weeks we uh, cover our favorite artists, things we know and love. And sometimes we, we go in kind of blind. And that's the case for me this week. I really only knew like uh, Cities and Dust. I knew their cover of Dear Prudence. And that was about it. Going through albums of the year, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll check out some of these other records in the 80s. And I, I kind of did like a quick uh, skip through of some of them and realized pretty quickly, like, not going to compete for my top five. So I didn't waste a lot of time on them. Uh, didn't really give them the time they deserve. So this is all mostly new for me. So how about you guys? Any experience with them going into the week? An odd experience for me. Um, first thing I knew about them was the song from Batman Returns, uh, which I got really into when I was like in middle school. And then I listened to them a little bit in high school. I made a playlist, as I've said before, like I used to make all these old like best of playlists just from what was popular on like the LimeWire listings and stuff. So had maybe 15 to 20 songs on a mix CD there. I do believe I've heard the last three before, which is an odd three to only know. But I also had like never really read or studied about them all that much. So I was like shocked to hear how like kind of post rock, like their original stuff was and all of that. So it was illuminating, though I have a little bit of experience. I knew zero, zero point zero is the amount of sushi and the banshees that I knew. Literally nothing. I had barely heard of the name if it wasn't for rich i don't even know if i you know would have been aware of their existence which is odd because they have you know a lot of big collaborators and some famous guitarists came through their band but nothing it never came up once i've never heard them even like mentioned in my readings and like songs of the year albums of the year like literally nothing so I must have just sort of glazed over any time that their name came up. So this was a completely 100% new experience. Very interesting uh, week we've had here. My readings. And my readings. My journals through the, my travels. All right, so we got 11 studio albums. Um, one is a cover record, and uh, that's about it. Pretty cut and dry, I think. So we can get into it. Who wants to kick it off? Well, I can kick, kick it as the Susie Virgin of the group here. At the bottom for me, I got their first album. Not surprising, probably. It is very post rock. That is The Scream. And, you know, I actually kind of like the music on this. I like some of the writing. I like the guitars. I like the drums fine. I think the drums are great, great drum sound. Steve Lilly White co-produced. What I'm missing here is like literally any melody at all. Susie just cannot sing at all. She's so monotone in these early records. And there's just no catchy choruses. There's no melodies to, to grab onto. And it's just like really metallic sounding, really post-rock. I know it's, I guess it's very influential. I'd never heard anyone mention it before. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, got a lot of good reviews though, so good for them. They started on a good uh, foot. 
The only song, uh, Overground is pretty good. I do like the vocal work, just not the singing itself, but how it's produced, how the vocals kind of come in over top of themselves, which is cool. I like the guitar sound on Carcass. I like Helter Skelter. I think it's not so, but that's the kind of cover I like. You know, they turn into this punk song and it, it just stands out as like a song with a melody and like with good writing. So it just towers over the rest of them. Uh, I think China Garden sucks, Staircase, not great. So I don't know, this, this album could be good, but I will never ever like an album like this. So I have it at two and a half stars for the screen. I'll go next because I think I'm kind of predictable with how I feel about this. And Jason is the most unpredictable. So let's close with him. However, I'm with Joe. I also have the scream at the bottom and I've got it at my 2.5, which is a little better than Joe's. I think it's decent. First sentence in my notes are 30 seconds in Joe rolls his eyes, (laughs) which I'm sure happened. Uh, Big time post-rock vibes with a touch of evil thrown in a little bit. It's objectively straight at you. I do like the drum work pretty much throughout their entire catalog. It's never something I ever came across in my readings about the drum work and the Susan Avanci catalog, but it's pretty good. I love the small, quick little drum outro uh, on the second track, Jigsaw Feeling. There's a lot of cool, scratchy, noisy guitar work that I like. Drum sounds really cool, really interesting playing. There's an odd elegance to a couple songs like Overground, which uh, Joe talked about. I like the chanting yelps of Susie when she does that. You get like some cool like early U2 influence, I would say. But yeah, the album definitely suffers from being monotone throughout the whole time. There's not a lot of change ups, no lack of variety, though. I think for a debut album, this is the chance to kind of get those kinks out. So it's at least faultable here, but you still have to mention it. It sounds pretty good for a day out debut album and for a uh, post this kind of post rock kind of side. I don't like the Helter Skelter cover at all it's not necessary to me whatsoever uh but i'm a bigger paul mccartney fan than both of you guys so that makes sense i like mirage a lot i really like the pretty scratchy wiry guitar the songs on their own are pretty cool but it's tough to get through all the time without getting a little beaten over the head i think metal postcard is really cool i love that eclectic little bend that the guitar work is doing joe's right the big problem here is she hasn't found herself as a singer yet she is exponentially better in like the second half of the catalog than she is here in the first part it's like she is a legit very good front man for a band and in this one she's not very good at all to be honest Decent debut, good sound, good mystique, definitely unique, but it leaves too much of the imagination for just like musical expression. So it's all atmosphere pretty much. 2.5. All right. So I do not disagree with you guys about the debut, but I actually think they take a bit of a step backwards on their second album. The bottom for me is Join Hands. And I don't think that I'm as much of a post-punk hater as Joe is, but I I think some of his points are valid when it uh, comes to the genre and it's certainly not my favorite genre. I do like some like angular spiky guitar lines. I can get into stuff like television and wire, but this record is just way too plotting for me. Uh, There's not enough of that interesting guitar work here. Like Joe said about the first record, I think Susie's melodies just are not very good early on. She holds notes really long and it's just kind of boring. I also think post-punk usually pretty good for some sweet bass lines, but nothing to be found here. And as far as that goes, a lot of like eighth note and quarter note root root note stuff, just really basic. Uh, The song Playground Twist, I think it's a little bit more rhythmically interesting, probably the best song on the record. Artistically, I think it's kind of interesting too. They're using like World War I to talk about current uh, world concerns. And, you know, I, I, I listen to a lot of slow, sad music and people always say, oh, it's boring, yawn, whatever. And it, it kind of drives me crazy. So I hate to use that as a like a criticism, but I just think that this record is just very uninteresting. The nail in the coffin for me uh, that ensures its last place Uh, is the 14-minute closer, The Lord's Prayer, which is just pretty rough. It's not exploratory. It doesn't do anything musically exciting. And maybe the point is for it to be like this cathartic release of aggression where they're just kind of like making all this noise, but I don't know. It it doesn't even come across that powerful. The drums and bass, you know, are very cleanly recorded. The guitar isn't loud enough. It just lacks impact. 
So this record I did not think was very good. I'm at two stars. All right. Don't totally disagree with what Jason said. However, my second last, we're what, number 10 now? I don't know how many albums he's, yeah. Number 10, I'm going with Kaleidoscope. For some reason, this album just did not grow on me at all. Most of this catalog, will spoiler, did grow on me in, in some case, um, where I just kind of learned to live with the sound. But Kaleidoscope, which comes uh, after Join Hands, and it's their first with Budgie on drums and John, I don't know how to say his name, Magooch is what it looks like. Mick Giok. No idea. John M C G E O C H comes on guitar. So kind of a different sound, less angular guitar, more reverb, more of those ringing chords. Production is a little cleaner. Uh, Susie's up front. Uh, sounds better production wise, but it actually, because she still can't sing at all. And the fact that she's like more forward in the mix just makes it even more noticeable that she's a bad singer at this point. Uh, the vocal range is just so limited on these early albums. Definitely gets a lot better, a lot more interesting. Uh, she uses her voice in many different cool ways, just not on this album. And we're still missing like any type of melody, any type of hook. Um, there's drum machines on here, which I don't love. Um, there's more um, like synths and stuff like that. Like there's more instrumentation but like none of it goes anywhere. It's all just real like atonal droning stuff. Really don't like um, Lunar Camel at all. One of my least favorites in their whole catalog. And um, I don't know, there, there seems to be even less energy on here. Like on Joint Hands, at least there's like some punk, I feel like, like leaking into the sound, uh, some cool guitar tones. This one just doesn't have anything that I want in Susie and the Banshees at all. And they would get a lot better. I think this is like one step back where they didn't quite know how to refine their sound for their new sound after they kind of left behind that real post-punk early stuff. So I know, a little awkward growth period, although I know a lot of people hold this a lot higher in regard. So I don't know where it's going to fall for everyone else, but for me, Kaleidoscope just did nothing, so it is my number 10. Two and a half stars. My number 10, I've got Join Hands, um, so two and a half stars. Uh, immediately, you get a little bit of a creativity, like a darker sound and this big change with some brassy carnival kind of sounds right on deck, uh, like Regal Zone at the beginning. But then, you know, I feel like the imagination dissipates a little bit. Everything's a little bit better than the debut, but a lot of fair sounding, much like the debut. Icon is a bit different bit different guitar tone i guess um i like that i like the rumbling drums and the bass her vocal though yeah still way too samey she's really operating in a very narrow window right here um and i don't hate it but it's just one thing all the time so it doesn't work for an album haunting goth coming in a little bit more i'd say here um as you get to like premature burial uh but the music just has to be way more descriptive like there's not a lot of interesting composition work here let's be honest it's basically all atmosphere with lyrics just bleh, dumped right on top of it kind of like lazy storytelling lazy playing it needs some accent some embellishment you know more amplified emotion it needs parts that are written to help convey the lyrics and all that it's just kind of lazily put together though i do like a lot of it uh mother and mine papa is flushing out a little bit of their identity which i think is good but pretty much you know, my complaints about most of the album start to get solved a little bit toward the album ending, but it's still not something I really want to reach back to, which is why I keep it at 2.5. It's slightly more interesting, slightly better than the debut. So 2.5 for Join Hands, number 10. All right. So my number 10, I think we're going to be working through the early stuff here for a little while longer still. I've got the Scream, the debut. I do think this record has some interesting elements, you know, starting listening chronologically. There's a few, you know, positives. I think Kenny Morris's, you know, heavy use of toms on the drums is pretty cool. There's some interesting guitar tones. The tones on this record aren't quite as flangy, and I think they're mixed a little better than they are on Join Hands. 
I think the record overall feels a little bit more varied. Um, Overground breaks out of their usual plotting for something that's almost approaching a ballad, which is kind of cool. Carcass has some actual force behind it, um, some forward momentum. Uh, the acoustic on Mirage, I think, is uh, like jangly almost. So you get a little bit of variance there. Um, you also have, you know, some different sounds coming in and coloring things. There's just more ideas overall. Still, though, all the things that you guys say about it is accurate. It's not melodic enough. It's not powerful enough. You know, I, I think it really shows how young they are, how raw they are. Not great songwriters yet. Susie's still developing as a singer very much so. It takes her a while to kind of get rolling in this catalog. But it does have a certain energy to it and a youthfulness to it. And like I said, there's more variety. So I think it's better than Join Hands. I don't think it drones on and on quite as much as that record does, but still not great. Just 2.5 stars for me still. Right. So number nine, Join Hands. So we'll pretty much, if you can ask, yes, please join hands with me. Uh, pretty much on the same track here, at least so far. But I think this is slightly more interesting than the debut. The band really hasn't improved at all. Although I think Steve McKay's guitar work, a little more interesting, a lot more variation, I think, in the tone. Uh, the placebo effect has this really almost like metal guitar riff, close to something like Judas Priest, uh, which I found pretty cool. Uh, Icon again, uh, I like the guitar attack, just nonstop chord playing. Uh, the bass playing is too repetitive, boring. Susie again, just monotone, doesn't really help the songs at all. So I'm pretty much just li uh, listening for Steve McKay to do cool stuff, which he does more on this one. Uh, Poppy Day, Regal Zone, I think have really cool guitar tones again. Playground Twist, I think is good. Uh, stand out on the album. A little more drama in the playing and the arrangements. Again, the guitar work from Matt Kay is the standout. And Love and Avoid has a nice punk spirit. I think Susie's doing a little bit more with some na-na's in the background and uh, the tempo's quicker, which if you can't play and you're, you're just a, not a great band, just speed up those tempos and most people won't notice. And this album seems to do that a little bit if you listen to it really loud. It's not bad. I didn't hate it. I didn't even hate the Lord's Prayer that much, even though it's 14 minutes of sort of insane inanity. Uh, maybe I'm mellowing out in my middle age here, but uh, I thought it was interesting. I like it better than a lot of those like weird 15, 20 minute, whatever Velvet Underground was doing with their long stuff. I can't remember what it's called, Murder Mystery. It's definitely better than stuff like that. And I don't know, it's, it's not a great album, but I didn't find myself hating it as much as I expected. So three stars, but a low three stars, it's like a six, six out of 10. Would you say it didn't make you want to kill yourself? It didn't make me want to kill myself, no. Not even, maybe for like a second. Then. Got it, right? Cool, okay, good. Yeah, we all have the same bottom three, just in slightly different orders. I've got number nine with Kaleidoscope, 2.5. Much more well-rounded, a little bit, not much more, a bit more well-rounded, mainstream, professional kind of sound. Less of a live feel, I'd say, a little more studio awareness. You get some of that more daunting, ominous feeling throughout. So, you know, kind of that identity sprinkling through just a little bit more as time goes on chronologically but still not nearly as tuneful as I want, not nearly as emotional as I want. The singing's not nearly as good as I want. Do like the additions of a little bit of synth, a little bit of dance beats. There's like a gritty underground devilishness full of like ritual feeling, that's cool. However, right now in the catalog, they aren't nearly as good as I imagined, but also more influential than I was aware. So I'll give them that. Red Light is pretty cool. Most of the songs like, the first two albums are just kind of flat. Melodies stay the same, beats stay the same, just simple backing track, not much else for four minutes. Lay down these cryptic ritual-esque kind of vocals. Skin's cool, cool drums. A little bit better than the one before, which is a little bit better than the one before. 
Yeah. There we go. 2.5, number nine, Kaleidoscope. All right. That is also my number nine, Kaleidoscope. Morris and McKay depart. You get Budgie and John McGeoch, I think. I don't know exactly. I found a uh, documentary about him on YouTube and that's how they said it in that. So that's what I'm going with it. And I think instantly you can tell, even though the record isn't like dramatically better than the first two, I think it's pretty obvious that they are more skilled and more nuanced uh, musicians than the uh, the previous guys in the band. Uh, I think, you know, they keep kind of the same feel, but just a little more uh, interesting. The drums still busy doing a lot of like Tom stuff, uh, but a little more rhythmically complex from Budgie, who I think is a really good drummer. And even he gets better as things go along. They just have, you know, better dynamics, better touch on their respective instruments. I think Susie on this record takes on a bit more responsibility. She's playing some guitar and synth on this record, some melodica. I think her melodies are starting to get a little more interesting on this record. A little less droney, but still not great. You know, I, I think they're still not fully formed. They're still a young band and it's a new lineup. So it's not quite gelling fully yet. Uh, but you know, like I said, a clear improvement. I think the catchiest song on this record and the catchiest of their catalog to this point, uh, the song Christine, I think has a pretty, pretty catchy melody to it. You know, e even though it's got kind of dark subject matter, it's about a woman with multiple personalities. I think it's almost a little playful. So it's not as dark. Um, the clouds are parting a little and you can actually see some, some lightness breaking through, uh, which not much of that on the first two records. I think uh, Red Light is a cool new approach for them to kind of experiment with. with. Uh, they got the program beat and this big fat like Moog sounding synth bass, which is cool. Paradise Place has a cool groove and, you know, the type of bass line that I'm looking for in some like good post-punk. Still very little, if anything, here that really excited me, but I think this is the beginning of seeing some potential in them, in them at least. Um, two and a half stars for Kaleidoscope. All right, let's do number eight. And this was the biggest disappointment in the catalog, for sure. Uh, really underwhelmed by Hyena from 1984, especially considering what came before it and what would come after it. Uh, you got Robert Smith of The Cure coming in to replace John McGeoch. And that is a big step down as far as I'm concerned. I don't hear much from Smith as far as guitars go on this. There's hardly any noticeable guitar work at all. Uh, more keys, more reverb, tons of reverb. Everything's just kind of buried in it, which I don't know. I don't, it's, it's fine, but I, I don't know. It's too much of a change from what they were doing on Kiss in the Dream House. And uh, as you'll find out, I have that one much higher. And again, you know, with Robert Smith coming in, you expect like some maybe choruses, some like stronger melodies, but those really take a step back as well. I don't, I mean, other than Dazzle, uh, which has uh, some strings on it, which is nice change. I thought that was a, at least an interesting addition. If you're gonna take away all the cool guitar, give me some strings. Swimming Horses has a cool experimental vibe to it. But, you know, I'm just missing what they were doing on the previous couple records. And it's just, I don't know, a little boring, again, a little droney. Dear Prudence is a fine cover, but it doesn't really excite me that much. Running Town has some nice piano. Pointing Bone is mixed really low for whatever reason. It sounds, I don't know, like a mistake. I don't know what they were doing with that if that was some sort of like experimentation or a reason for that, but it just seems bad that they would do that. And there's like, you know, cure level of, like, I don't know, sheen, mist, something over this album. Uh, so you have like that darkness and the interesting like textures in there, but there's just no good melodies. There's not a single good chorus outside of Dear Prudence. And uh, yeah, just disappointed, uh, really liked what they were doing with the guitars on the last couple albums. And this just loses all of that momentum. Robert Smith, pretty pointless addition to the band, if you ask me. 
So yeah, three stars for Hyena. I think the Robert Smith stamp is pretty evident on that album, um, but you're it sounds like you're looking for a late cure rather than the era of the cure when this album came out with albums like pornography and stuff like that. My number eight is a tough one for me to analyze. Um, it is the Rapture, and I have it at 2.5. They used to think much higher of it, and I don't know. I'm not crazy about this drum sound on this album at all. It seems to be at odds with the rest of the style or vibe of the band. And some of the experimentations don't really work for me. At times they're like kind of almost going like Baroque elements with like cellos and stuff like that. I don't know, it's not really helping. I think a lot of the songs are just so caught in between what they want to be. Like the song Tearing Apart, I think is a great example of this. It sounds like there's three different ideas of songs there and they kind of just morph them all into one. The identity of this album is just too all over the place, which is like not a criticism of any other album. It's not a lost cause. There's some good songs. I think Fall From Grace, Stargazer, Not Forgotten, pretty cool. At times, it seems like way too like stripped down or like cleaned up or like Susie Light. I don't know, maybe at times it sounds like someone doing an impression of like Susie and the Banshee, the band with actual Susie being the front of it. I don't know, there's something just really, I can't put my finger on that doesn't quite work for me about this album. And just like a lot of the strings and stuff they experiment with don't quite work. You know, on this album coming off a good stretch for me, they're not growing the way I want them to. And also staying on to some of the things from the past that I don't really want them to stay. It's tough. I'm, I'm conflicted about this one. I'm going 2.5, which is decent. I don't really want to listen to it again. I don't want to figure out why I'm conflicted about it anymore. And so let's put it to rest. Number eight, The Rapture, 2.5. All right. So we were right in sync on the first three at the bottom, and now we're splitting all apart. And I've got a record that sounds like Joe has quite high. I've got A Kiss in the Dream House at number eight. Uh, For this record, they got more into exploring the potential of the studio. It's the first record that they use real strings on. McGee plays recorder on a track. They tried to avoid using synths. So there's like a lot of vocal effects and like a lot of layering used. And I think all of this is important for the growth and evolution of the band. But for me, I think it's a little bit of a step backwards in songwriting from Juju. I definitely think there's a lot of cool and interesting sounding tracks here, but as far as like songs and melodies go, it never reaches the heights of like a spellbound or in the light. I also don't think it ever really finds its sound. I think Juju is like really united by all of this really cool, unique guitar work. And because they're experimenting so much on this record, like all the songs feel like kind of different. They all kind of have their own unique identity. So it doesn't hang together quite as well as an album for me, I don't think. My favorite tracks on the record, probably She's a Carnival, uh, which has this like fast poppy tune with Budgie doing like an almost country train beat on it, which is interesting and different for them. I also like the song Melt a lot, which is kind of cool, mysterious ballad. Has this really interesting sounding type of mandolin thing on it. I'm not sure if it's an electric guitar with effects or what it is, but it's really cool. Susie's backing vocals on this record sound really great. So I think that's kind of the beginning of her like becoming a stronger vocalist and uh, learning how to use the studio to to manipulate things. So I definitely think it's an important record in their evolution, just not my favorite song for song. So three stars for Kiss in the Dream House. All right, going on to number seven. And I have the obligatory cover album, Through the Looking Glass. What, I mean, is that weird? It's probably where cover albums go, kind of right in the middle. Uh, and I think this is a pretty good cover album. I absolutely love their cover of the Sparks tune. This town isn't big enough for both of us. It, I love it, but it also kind of makes me wonder, like, if Susie could do that with her vocals, why wasn't she doing stuff like that before? Like I heard this song and I'm, I didn't realize it was a cover album at first. And I was like, finally, they, they did it. They found their sound. That's is, this is it. And then I realized it was a cover album. I'm like, God damn it. That's a spark song. Um, but she nails it. The band nails it. There's a huge diversity of tracks. I don't think I've seen a cover album with like a bigger spread 
You have a song like This Down and Big Enough for Both of Us. And then you have This Wheels on Fire from Dylan and Danko. And then the next song is Strange Fruit, uh, the Billie uh, Holiday classic. Uh, there's an Iggy Pop, a John Cale. So this is just like all over the place with interesting picks. Some of them work, some of them don't. Passengers, I like a lot, I like the horns. And I think their updating of Strange Fruit is really beautiful and powerful. Uh, this Wheels on Fire is cool. I just can't, you know, can't hold a candle to either the Gene Clark or the band's version. But I think they, they do it pretty interestingly enough for their style. I think it works. Uh, so I'm up to 3.5 for this. I think it's pretty solid. Maybe four stars, if, you know, but it's, it's a cover album. So I have to take off a, a half a star for that. But not, not bad. Not bad. Good performances. Uh, my number seven is Juju, and I'm skipping three. I'm going all the way to three, five. I think this is a really good album. Uh, Spellbound, probably my favorite song to date in the chronology. Into the Light, super awesome. Has a really cool, like, digital new wave kind of flair. So they're bringing in a little bit more influence and stuff to, other than just, like, that droney, cryptic kind of thing going on. The lead and the hook in that song is sensational. And you're getting a lot more melody, a lot more tunefulness. Halloween is really cool and is a bit more rocking and downhill than usual. They're just like putting more influences on the playing. They're doing like everything that I was complaining about in the first few albums where it's like, you need to find a way to express your message and your emotion and your style, not just through the sound and the atmosphere, but through your composition of the songwriting. And they're starting to do that. And it works. The guitar work uh, is really cool. Getting a little bit of like pretenders with the vibes here in like the early eighties. Uh, which is cool. I think Monitor is amazing. It's way ahead of its time. It's like almost metal. It's like almost freaking new metal. Like, I can't believe the song isn't from 1997. Like, it's like, what is going on? It's really awesome. There's more fire and bite to her voice. Pretty, pretty damn good. Not quite there, like with the Susie we know and love. And even the artier stuff, the more post-rock stuff on here that doesn't have some of the new creative influences, like uh, Head Cut, has a lot more musicality to it. And like, what you know jason was talking about in the post-rock stuff that he does like the really cool like rhythmic angular guitar things that like wire television does you get that and it's more interesting it's a lot cooler i love the closer voodoo dolly um you know kind of scary maybe their biggest haunted tale anthem so eerie with like those descending guitars and mood falling apart so i think all the songs are really interesting you know, they're not doing their poppier kind of stuff yet, but the for the art house vibe that they're still holding on to, they're doing it really well and a lot more memorable. So I really dig it. All right. My number seven is Through the Looking Glass, uh, same as Joe. Uh, it's the second and final album with John Valentine Carruthers on guitar. It's a covers album, like he said, and it's got a bunch of cool uh, song selections on it. I think more often than not, the covers work really well on this record. I think they find a good balance of kind of like respecting the originals and adding their own spin on the tunes. The one that doesn't work for me too well is this wheels on fire. And I don't know. I don't, I don't think their version of it's very good. And it's kind of weird to me that it was the lead single for the record as well. Strange fruit, a really bold choice. I think they get away with it by having an amazing arrangement, the sweeping strings and the mournful kind of like funeral dirge jazz band that comes in in the solo section of the song, I think is really cool. Yeah. The sparks cover is really awesome. I think their version of The Passenger by Iggy is is really cool too. They add the horns to it, which just makes, I don't know, makes it really interesting. They don't change the song itself very much, but they just add those horns and it just brings a, another dimension to it. I think this record is less moody and atmospheric than the previous record, uh, Tinderbox. There's more emphasis on the songs here than there is on the sound. And Susie comes to the forefront more than ever before, I think, on this record, almost to the point where it starts to feel like a solo project a little bit. Um, she's really up front and I don't know the, the maybe the cleanness of the production on this a little bit um, makes the band feel a little neutered or something. I'm not sure, but um, I, for a covers record, I think it's, it's pretty uh, good. I like it. Three stars, or, sorry, three and a half stars for through the looking glass. Well, we are hitting some high scores already for these. We're only halfway through surprising Jason's all the way up to 3.5. Although knowing him, that'll be the top. He just seven albums of 3.5. Uh, my number six is a 
I got Superstition from 1991. And this album sounds a lot like a Prince album. Uh, Stephen Haig comes in. He was a producer, did stuff with Pet Shop Boys, New Order, Erasure. Um, a lot of famous albums, actually. Very good list. He did um, The Innocents from Erasure. He did The Single True Faith and some other big stuff pet shop boys please so he's a pretty experienced producer and he takes the band right back into the 80s because this just has such an 80s production to it like 80s synth and then there's a whole lot of whammy bar heroics for whatever reason like a lot of like screaming guitars which i found to be at odds with like what their sound should be uh, so this album kind of, like, I feel like I should love it because it is like really into, it's like 1987 came alive into my ears, but it, I, I just don't know if it works for a Suji and the Banshees album completely. I think they get away with it. Uh, the band itself, I mean, Budgie is such a good drummer. They bring in uh, John Klein on guitars and Stephen Severin, I think has gotten a lot better at bass by this point. Uh, Kiss Them For Me sounds a lot like Alphabet Street from Prince. Uh, Fear the Unknown has some cool screaming guitar parts. Cry sounds like it's a rocker straight from 1984. Uh, Drifter, they kind of get in this uh, gothic sound that doesn't quite work anymore with, with this album the sound is just completely different at this point. But Susie herself, her vocals are so much better. Uh, Little Sister, Shadow Time, just so much more dynamic. There's a lot more like high falsetto stuff, a lot more vibrato, and a, just a lot more interesting to listen to her sing. So, I mean, there's some cool stuff. Silly Thing sounds a lot like You Soon Right Round by Dead or Alive, which is fine, but it is 1991. And I don't know, I get that they're trying something new and trying to, you know, break into the charts into America a little bit, but I don't know. I think this is a bit of a step back from uh, Peep Show. And uh, so it's fine. Uh, three and a half stars. But I don't know, there's just something odd about the sound from a band like Susie and the Banshees that we started on this post-punk stuff. And now we're in less like screaming guitar solos and synth pop so I mean, it's cool and reinvention but not totally successful my number six is a kiss in the dream house uh i love like the more kind of embracing the 80s a little bit not the you know hair metal or power pop or pop chart stuff but you know you get sort of like yeah maybe a little like 80s roxy music vibes or you know talk talk with kind of those really beautiful strings and stuff coming in a lot of a little bit more effects that aren't really done by, you know, keyboards and stuff, but they're putting in a lot more texture, I guess is the best way to say it. Even get some Cure influence in there um, without Robert Smith actually being part of this album. You get a more lush, vibrant sound, far less wiry, less scratchy. Um, it's way more illuminated. It's prettier, just simply. I like the bounciness to the guitar and that really kind of pretty angelic acoustic guitar underneath in the song Cascade. Uh, and Susie's really feeding off just a better crop of tunes. Her singing is so much better. She's conveying so much more. She's doing a wider range. There's some really cool creativity with a lot of different instruments. Sounds kind of like recorder or like pan flute on grief fingers. Everything just so much more tuneful and composed all the way through and well thought out. Um, even Obsession, which is more morose than most of the other stuff on the album, has like cool texture behind it. And most, you know, the kind of tracks in the past on this way would. Uh, She's a Carnival is a lot of fun. I think Jason mentioned that one. Um, I think it has a great chorus. I love the doubling on the vocals. She has a great yelp on it. Circle has that really cool, like ornate string stuff. Just really a lot of growth on this album with these tracks and the effort they put into it. Melt is low key, like really epic in a way. I love it. There's just a good liveliness to a lot of it, like Unpainted Bird. Cocoon is like this really weird, you know, cryptic jazz eulogy kind of song. I love the drums and slow dive, one of their more fun tracks. They're just having a lot more fun and getting a lot more creative and you're just using kind of like that canvas a lot more and using a lot of more tools in the arsenal. So, you know, you give good musicians a lot more stuff to work with. 
And I think Jason mentioned that uh, I'm sticking with Magooch here for the pronunciation. I love that. We're going Magooch using a lot more instruments and it pays off. Songwriting solid. Everything's just sounding better. 3.5, number six, Kiss in the Dream House. All right. My number six is their final record, The Rapture. I don't know. This one, I had trouble uh, figuring out exactly how I felt about it. First time through the discography, I liked it a good bit. And the second time through, I think most of the records grew on me. And this one grew off a little. I don't know. It's it's kind of close in sound to the previous record, Superstition. But I think it's a little muddier or swampier sounding in the mix. And I think, I don't know, there's like a, a weird mix of material here. There's stuff that sounds a whole lot like Superstition, really poppy kind of, you know, uh, type of thing, 80s pop. There's also kind of a throwback to some of their post-punk stuff, uh, slightly artier material. And then there's also some really guitar heavy stuff that's like trying to fit in with mid 90s post grunge or whatever. So it's kind of strange. I don't know if all the tracks kind of work together that well. Not really sure exactly what they were going for, but there are a handful of songs that I like a good bit. I think Oh Baby is really cool. Tearing Apart, I think is great. Um, I don't know. There's just not quite as many sticky melodies on this record as there were on uh, Peep Show and on Superstition. So I don't know. I, I think it's just not quite up to those uh, records, which are some of my favorite in the catalog. But yeah, I think it's it's mostly pretty good. Uh, the one track, though, that doesn't work at all, I don't think, is the Lonely One, which is this, like, really ill-advised, almost tropical-sounding song. I don't have any idea. It's, like, almost like a weird Sugar Ray song or something. I don't know. It's really bizarre. I thought that was uh, terrible. But the rest of the record, not bad, but kind of, like, all over the place. So, I don't know. This was a weird one. I think it's a, a good record, though. Three and a half stars for The Rapture. Right, I'm just jumping all over the place. My number five is gonna be from 1981. It is Juju, and man, does it start off awesome. Spellbound, Into the Nut, Into the Light, Arabian Nights are probably, not probably, the three best tracks that they had done to this point, bar none. Just fantastic, uh, more melody. The monotone delivery, I mean, she grew in, in vocal range and like, you know, just her melodies are so much more interesting here. It's still very gothic and dark in spirit. The sound variety is just so much larger in scope here. Uh, I think McGeoch's guitar work on Spellbound is absolutely fantastic. Really influential, you can hear that sound in Johnny Marr. And all throughout the 80s, that like, just ceaseless cordage that he's doing. Uh, really love it. Budgie's drums are fantastic on these songs. Really loud, cool tribal rhythms he's doing in there that just like comes out of nowhere, breaks everything up. Really incredible stuff. Uh, and then you just go downhill, just bring a big old explosion by the time you get to Voodoo Dolly, which is just monotone and terrible, monotonous, tedious, uh, that and head cut just completely torpedoed the album for me, um, which is a shame because Into the Light, the second track, uh, almost danceable, great big echoing chords, there's some really cool, I don't know what it is that they're doing. The synth line like turns into the guitar part, it, whatever they're doing, I don't know if it's even a synth or like some kind of flute or Whatever it is, it sounds awesome. Um, Arabian Nights is really cool as well. Uh, if it wasn't for that, well, the second half, Side B isn't great. Side A is probably their best work that they ever done on any of their albums. Um, only Sin in My Heart from Side B is, is any good. Cool dark pop song. Some cool minor key guitar stabs, but that, that uh, Night Shift head cut Voodoo Dolly, even Monitor, a little bit on side A, it just doesn't work for me. So you got those spectacular highs, but then you got those like bottom scraping lows. So 
cool stuff though. Really love the guitar tones from the Giok and Budgie's drums just get better and better. So uh, points the way forward for them, but 3.5 still for Juju. Better, way better scores for Joe so far than I thought imaginable. Um, so, all right, let's go to number five. I got Hyena. I, yeah, like I said before, uh, I think the Robert Smith influence is here. I mean, you're not going to get those big, like arpeggio, big hooks, like uh, guitar parts, like Friday, I'm in love or anything like that. But it does sound like that era of the cure. Um, in many ways, it kind of just sounds like pornography too, to me in some parts, which I think is really cool. That's maybe my favorite cure album. Uh, I love the opening track, Dazzle, the symphony and everything is awesome. And it still has that underground kind of gothy vibe to it. There's a cool like primal sensation on this album with the songwriting. Uh, like the album before, the songs are nice and catchy, have a good pulse. There's a little bit of eeriness, I think. Not sure if I like all the ideas. I think a couple things missed the mark. I'm not crazy about the organ and Take Me Back, even though I think it's a pretty good song. Otherwise, I just don't quite like that organ sound. Belladonna is really cool. I love that bass and that kind of icy 80s-ness to it. Swimming Horses is great. That piano sound is like straight up the cure for me. Cool little seductive number. Bring Me the Head of the Preacher Man is so friggin' awesome. Can't believe Joe didn't mention that. Sounds like something that he would love with the westernness of it. It's like this showdown of horror movie villains or something. It's kind of like this, such a cool mystique. Running Town, I think, has one of Robert Smith's better uh, lead works here in this album. Songs are very good. Um, so I'm enjoying kind of everything chronologically more and more as we go on. It's just not quite great yet, but it will be soon. So 3.5, really good, Brian, number five, Hyena. All right, my number five is Juju. And so much of this discography is just like really incremental evolution to the point where like one record after the next doesn't sound that different. But when you think like five records back, you're like, whoa, how did we get here? But I think one of the bigger leaps in their catalog is from Kaleidoscope to Juju, I think is a really big step forward, especially like Joe said, those are first couple tracks on the record are just fantastic. Everything just sounds a lot more professional, the sound, the production. I think the songwriting is a lot better. So I don't know. I think Susie's uh, vocals are getting a lot more confident too, more forceful, a little more guttural, able to belt a little bit more. I think the addition of Budgie on the previous record just really paying off, making a huge difference in this era of the band. Just, I think he's getting more comfortable now within the band on this record and just really uh, flexing a bit, doing some really great work on this record. Uh, Spellbound, the opening track, super cool, really interesting guitar parts. Um, they go from like picking single note things to like these fast strumming, almost like Johnny Marr-esque type of things. Really, really cool. And in fact, this is a few years away from the Smiths. So this predates Johnny Marr. Uh, Into the Light is awesome. That riff is so cool and how it works against the drum beat, just super cool. And then how it flips into the chorus and does that like descending line, just really awesome. I loved it. Uh, a really sweet melody on that one too from Susie. I like the kind of dancey disco beat on Monitor, more cool guitar stuff on that track. I think the record previous this, Kaleidoscope, they were flirting a lot more with electronics, getting into kind of like some synths and program beats and stuff. And I think on this record, they really kind of like recommit to the guitar. And I think that pays off. And I think that was a good move because uh, the guitar work on this is really awesome. Joe is correct, though, that it's front loaded. The first several tracks are the best. And I don't think that the side B necessarily torpedoes the record for me, but I definitely feel like the tracks on the back half just kind of feel like lesser versions of the songs on the first half. Not None of those stand out quite as much, but I, I don't think they're terrible or anything. Um, and like I said, just a huge improvement over the first three Suzy records. So uh, a good record with some great songs, three and a half stars for Juju. Okay, Doki, uh, we're gonna jump around again from 81 to 88 for Peep Show. Uh, and we've got a revolving door here of guitarists. This is the first one with John Klein, who comes in for John Valentine Carruthers. I think it's John, is it John Valentine Carruthers? Can't keep these damn guitarists straight. 
Um, but they're all excellent guitarists. The band has a penchant for picking good ones. John Klein comes in, um, maybe a little less melodic and catchy, but does have an interesting, more diverse sound. Uh, can absolutely rip it up. Like he shows on Burn Up on this, which is a cool like cow punk vibe. And this one, this album is definitely all over the place, which is cool. They're really showing off their diversity. Uh, Peep Show sounds like nothing else in their catalog before or after. Uh, it's a little discombobulating, but in a really cool way. And it really reminded me of the St. Vincent self-titled album. Like she kind of just ripped that off completely. So it's always interesting to hear like where ideas come from. And clearly uh, Peep Show was an inspiration for her. You also have some Kate Bush influence on here, I think, uh, Killing Jar. Good, powerful groove here. Uh, her vocals, I think, take another step forward. Uh, her high notes are much stronger and she's just doing a lot with her voice kind of swooping, a little more fantastical, a little, you know, reminds me of Kate Bush, which is cool. Scarecrow, Carousel, both these songs have that, you know, maybe Hounds of Love feel to them, uh, supernatural, fantastical, but, you know, pretty and mystical as well, not quite as dark as their gothic stuff. Ornaments of Gold has a cool 80s uh, sound to it. They've got some stabbing synths, nice drumming from Budgie who really came to appreciate him a lot uh, throughout this catalog. Just interesting drum parts on pretty much every album, really consistent as well. And um, you know, this is just a good, good solid album. The Last Beat of My Heart has a cool fast waltzy feel, some accordion in there, tons of emotion. And uh, you know, it's not as dark as Juju or Tinderbox, but it's, it's got this cool supernatural charm a witchy gothic spirit that's mysterious and vibrant instead of flat and black is what I wrote. Uh, so I'm up to four stars for Peep Show. I think it's pretty good. Um, the melodies are there. It kept me hanging on throughout the album. So yeah, enjoy this one. Four stars. Nice. Some good points there. Uh, Jason also made a good point about Juju being the biggest leap in their catalog and everything else kind of just nudging along. And that's how I feel. Uh, but I'm going with Superstition as my number four. Very close to four stars, but I just got it at 3.5. It's very good. Goth really fading out here by this time and becoming more kind of this beauty romance, shoegaze pop kind of dance, pop, dream, pop, 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 pop kind of thing. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure exactly which Prince album Joe's talking about, but he might be right. Uh, pop in general, really. Songs are kind of radio friendly more than anything else I've ever done, full of hooks. Well, kind of holding on to a little bit more of their rock vibes early 90s dream pop for sure but it's not all brightness and rainbows drifter is very gloomy for sure her voice is like an angel on this album though she is just doing everything she can to carry the band um from a little bit of a step back from the stretch they were on there's a cool like seductiveness to the vibe um a little bit of it's almost like girlier than anything they've done in a way a little pristine very heavenly and vivid little synth heavy at times, Little Sister is a really cool song. And at the same time, everything's like a little bit more laid back, a little bit roaming, a little bit more spacious, a little bit more freeing, soaring lines and stuff. You know, it doesn't have that wiriness. Uh, obviously, Shadow Time, I think is a really cool song, has a cool kind of curish lead to it. Silly Thing um, has these really cool like guitar swells and whammy bar action that Joe was talking about, which I think really adds to it. And, you know, it kind of plays to that early 90s vibe a lot and just kind of letting the guitars be like the, the vibrating sensations going on. Good bass work on this album. Song that really doesn't do it for me, though, is Gotta Get Up. Seems like it's caught between a bunch of things, maybe signaling the problems that I have with Rapture. Uh, Silver Waterfalls has some really cool guitar work on it. So yeah, I kind of see it as like this like beautiful flowery kind of, you know, rock album. Um, I like the slow somber touch of Softly a lot, just doing that really cool whispery, delicate, delicate whispery vocals and the strings mixed with that deep synth, really nice. Uh, I think there's a lot of music that I like maybe 10, 15 years after this that you can kind of point to this era or this album 
um, you know, something like uh, Blonde Redhead doing a little bit of kind of this sound a little bit. I like them a lot. The Ghost in You, I think, is really great, catchy closer. Um, I think this album is lacking a little bit of emotion, relies a little bit too much of aesthetic, but you get it a lot toward the end with Softly. And then with Ghost of You brings kind of that emotional touch, you know, toward the end. Lyrically, I think there's um, some good emotion throughout the album, but um, this one really brings a good punch to it at the end. So pretty close to four, maybe eventually, um, but 3.5, probably not eventually because I've heard this album a good bit. So Superstition, number four, 3.5. Very good. All right. My number four is Hyena. Uh, opens with the Chandos Players, which is a 27-piece uh, orchestra members of the London Symphony Orchestra which is a pretty uh, big and epic way to start your record uh, goes into the track Dazzle which I think is a great tune really good melody on that not crazy about the mix on this entire record though it sounds really cluttered um, there's a lot of reverb on stuff and I don't know it doesn't work too well I think this is the first record of, of theirs that doesn't sound like a post-punk record really um, they're kind of getting more into pop and uh, new wave and that type of influence. Um, and it does have that kind of like cure sheen to it. And it could have been great, I think, because I think some of the songwriting is really good here. It's really just the mix holding it back for me. I think Smith uh, coming in is interesting. He seems to bring a real focus on the songs. This is the same year that the top came out by the cure. So I think there's some similarity there between the top and this. It's kind of like the top sort of like a uh, a bridge transitional record kind of caught between earlier more experimental post-punk whatever you want to call it type of stuff and more straight ahead uh, songwriting with pop popular production I can't imagine like a track like Swimming Horses on a previous Suzy record such a cool piano part really different so they're, they're branching out a lot Running Town I think is really cool drums and bass um, are just locked in on that track while you get those like phasey guitars and piano uh, that play really interesting line over top of it. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's kind of an in-between record, really cool songs. I disagree with Joe. I think the melodies on this record are pretty strong throughout. The problem is that they're, they're ever, not only the melodies, but everything on this record is a little buried in reverb. Um, and, and there's just not a lot of clarity not a great sounding record for me. I wish the mix was different. Uh, it could have been much better, but as it stands, it's a good record. Three and a half stars. I am going to agree with you about the mix. I don't think I mentioned it, but I do recall the first time I listened to it, I went and double checked my subwoofer to make sure it was on. Cause I was like, where is the bass sound on this? So I'm, I'm with you. I was gonna say Joe's right about, um, I forgot to mention the uh, pointing bone. I don't know if it's just like, what made it to streaming services or if it's really that way on the actual record but something screwy is going on I don't know if it's the mastering or what but it's like significantly quieter than the rest of the record it's really bizarre it's like what's with famous musicians coming in and like being bad producers to these uh famous albums come on him and Bowie should get together maybe take some production courses because yeah not great but my number three we're still at four stars here for The Rapture. And this one, I don't know, it grew on me. This one has a definite attempt at a mid-90s sound. I get some pretenders and stuff in there as well. Some louder guitars, a little less of that 80s, a little less of the princiness that we're going for in Superstition. And it only starts out kind of okay. So it sort of lulls you into a false sense of, okay, so this is a record that didn't need to be made. This is well after their peak. Um, oh Baby and Tearing Apart. Just not, not crazy about the way it starts, but then it starts getting good. Uh, I think Stargazer is pretty great. I think Fall From Grace is just super pretty alternative rock. There's some upbeat hand claps. Susie's kind of channeling Chrissy Hind a little bit. Uh, there's a cello. I think it sounds like a violin, but there's no violin credited on the album. So I think it's just a cello played up really high, um, which gives us this cool, unique timber to it. And just a really great melody, really strong pop song. Uh, Not Forgotten has a badass guitar part. Uh, 
the band's just working speedier tempos here, which is great. Uh, Buddy's drums, nice and powerful, propulsive. They don't completely abandon the goth spirit, though. The sick child has a creepy vibe to it, more cello work, uh, which is pretty cool. And Susie's vocals, I think, on this album are really interesting, even surpassing what she had done in the past. And she basically got better every single album. And now, finally, on the final album, she's a really good, I think, singer, using her voice in a lot of unexpected and uh, beautiful ways as well. Forever, really cool cascading synth line, really unique, recognizable just instantly. I don't love the 11 minute plus the rapture, but uh, there's some interesting parts to it. It's certainly better than um, whenever the Lord's Prayer from Join Hands. So not, not terrible. I wish it was the closer though. It's odd that there's a couple tracks after it, but I think they're pretty good. Love Out Me, uh, a good ender, powerful alt rocker, loud and aggressive. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the guitar sound works better on this. They don't sound so 80s. They don't sound too out of place. I think it sounds pretty good for mid 90s, surprisingly uh, good for the mid 90s for a band that started in the 70s. So I think they work their way into the 90s pretty well here. And uh, I dig it, uh, four stars and uh, definitely, I don't know, much better than a final album in the mid 90s than you'd expect for a band like this. I was impressed with The Rapture. All right. My number three um, is going to be Through the Looking Glass. And I've got it at four stars. It's my first great album. I think it's one of the better cover albums I've ever heard, to be honest. Um, and it does everything you kind of want from a covers album. They kind of make everything their own. I love the Sparks cover. I'm with you guys. It is so cool. And it's hard to like imagine listening to that Sparks song and being like, how could anyone cover this and do it kind of different and make it work? And they found a way like sure, her vocal range is just insane on it. She's just carrying everything. And like Joe said, it's also just one of the coolest track lists of songs on a cover album I've ever seen. It's every song is different and unique from one another to make it really diverse. There's some songs that are kind of like bands that are kind of obvious opportunities for them to cover. And then some stuff like Billie Holiday or Wheels on Fire, which you wouldn't see coming. I think that the band is really good on this. Susie, I think, though, is doing most of the heavy lifting. I knew the original of everything, but the song Trust in Me, uh, which I think has this cool kind of Nick Cave kind of delivery. Hall of Mirrors is really well done. The bass on it is great. I like Wheels on Fire a lot. I think the reimagining works a lot basically just like sounds goffed up and dark and haunting. Very cool. Strange Fruit is really creepy and really cool. I love the horns and strings. Your Lost Little Girl, very cool. Cryptic and mystical, and I prefer it very much to the Doors track. The Passenger is one of the only songs that they don't really change very much. They just kind of make it a little bit different, adding the horns and all that. Um, And it's a cool song for them to do because it's just got like this catchy, straightforward guitar part. and It's a little more upbeat. Sea breezes, super cool, really more like casual and wavy. And you can kind of see some of these songs influence the kind of material that they would want to do after this. So yeah, I think it's a really impressive covers record. I would very much love to go back to it. I think it's a great album. Um, So my number three, four stars through the looking glass. All right. My number three is Tinderbox, which uh, is a really cool record. Uh, 1986, they got uh, John Valentine Carruthers coming in, the fourth guitarist to come through the band. And if I was pressed, I'd probably say he was my favorite of all their guitar players. Um, I think he has some really interesting guitar work on this record. This record, I think, retains some of the pop hooks of Hyena, while at the same time being darker, more mysterious, and kind of reverting back to their earlier work at least in terms of the mood of the record. So it's a good mix of the the darker mood with some good pop hooks in there as well. I really like the sound and mix on this record. The drums sound great, especially the kick drum. There's a great sense of space to everything. Everything feels like it has a really big reverb on it, but it doesn't really. And when you focus on it, like you can pick out individual instruments sounding really focused and the overall mix doesn't get washed out the way it does on Hyena. 
Cities and Dust was the one track that I knew really well coming into the week. And I just think that song is an absolute banger. One of my favorite 80s songs, period. I think it's incredible. It's massive sounding and it's haunting and it's hooky and it's dancey and it's dark all at once. It's just such a cool song. I think the guitar and key sounds on this record are really good too. Uh, super dialed in each one occupying just the right amount of sonic space and the way the guitar and keyboards interact with each other sounds so good budgie's drumming really excellent on here as well very cool and complex parts but never overplaying i think he's just right on it all the time i think it's a, a really interesting record and on all of the um wikipedia pages of their records there's a section where they talk about like people who have like praised the record publicly and uh the one that i thought was really interesting for this record was billy howardell from a perfect circle and when i read that i was like oh my god this record is exactly the blueprint of everything a perfect circle ever did um so once like once i read that it was so obvious like they just ripped this record off completely so uh four stars for me for tinderbox okay let's talk more about tinderbox it is my number two uh really strong record was my number one for most most of the the week the listening experience just got surpassed at the end but i think this is a very good record candy man the sweetest chill like jason was saying there's a darkness a uh, nice gothic um uh, aura around this it's a little mystical i think it's a good step away from what they're doing on hyena which was kind of boring for me Closer to Juju, Kissing the Dream House. But I think the band sounds really good. Fudgy keeps getting better and better on the drums. Uh, Susie's vocals, best that they had been to this point. Again, I mean, she just gets better every album. So I think this is the sweet spot for like the hooks and the way the band sounds. Uh, just really good songwriting. Um, the synth work in Candyman's great, really good rhythmic aspect. Uh, some cool, distinctive swooning bass lines in there as well. I don't, I mean, the bass on most of these albums, I don't really notice from Steven Severin much, but uh, some cool parts, Candyman particularly. Get a little Kate Bush again on Sweetest Chill. This unrest has a cool drum intro. Uh, and then it gets this almost metallic Steve Harris-like bass momentum to it, uh, which is cool. Kind of goes back and forth between these slower brooding parts. This like gallop, uh, which is pretty sweet. Uh, Cities and Dust, like it a lot. Uh, John Valentine Carruthers reminds me a little bit of Alex Lifeson, the way he plays uh, chords and stuff, even the tone a little bit. Uh, there's some bell or clavichord like synths on cannons which is great so there's a lot of cool instrumentation that they're throwing in there i think it sounds really good and i think probably track for track this is their most consistent 92 degrees is good lands and parties fall cannons full side b is strong so there's no fall off from those uh first couple big tracks just a real good 80s album has enough artiness enough you know, gothicness, but it's pop forward enough. It sounds great. The instrumentation and playing is all great. So it's a strong four stars for Tinderbox. Let's keep talking about Tinderbox because it's on fire. Um, yeah, good shout with the Lifeson guitar work. Uh, I often want to say that about albums and then I refrain because I don't want people in the comments to be like, oh, we get it. You guys love Russia. the fuck? <laughs> But yeah, I'm getting it. Uh, you get those tubey kind of bends and twists and very uh, incendiary textures. Um, yeah, good blend of like goth and rock and pop here. But I do think it's kind of like at the same time, a bit bigger and brighter and definitely fuller in the vocal sounds. That's for sure. Uh, but it does have like that cool icy chilliness and with like a little bit of lively pulse and a little bit of dance vibes at times with like sweetest chill. The unrest I think is really cool, chilly and shadowy. I like the guitar getting like nastier and more venomous. Then that song becomes like this cool, like feverish, like menacing dream. Cities and Dust, yeah. I mean, you said it. Her vocals are just so much better here and they're putting more effects on it. Not that she needs it. I mean, she's performing good, but everything's just coming together. 
Cannons is really great. You get a little bit of that fattier bass to it. Cool kind of jangly guitar part. Very U2-ish at times, especially with like when it picks up with those bells kind of rattling off and those powerful drums. Very early 80s U2 to me. Parties Fall is cool. There's a lot of really cool swooning and dreamy playing of just like goth rock and roll. 92 Degrees is one of the only tracks that doesn't excite me quite as much as the other ones. It sounds like it's just kind of like something they wanted to get one more track on there that sounds like all the other songs kind of combined. But Land's End is really cool. The drums rule. I think the album ends on the last couple of tracks a little bit weaker, but it keeps the magic alive enough to make it a great album. Four stars for me for Tinderbox. All right. My number two is going to be Peep Show. Uh, they became a five piece on this record. They add John Klein on guitar, but I think maybe even more importantly, they add a fifth member, Martin McCarrick on cello, keys, and accordion. Uh, by this point, I think, as you guys have said, Susie had mastered her voice, just could convey so much and do so much, just really expressive and really in total control of her voice. And it's hard to believe that, you know, f- from where she started that she got to this is just really cool. I think the arrangements on this record are really cool and more unpredictable than they had been on previous records. And I mean, that could be the flexibility of having a fifth member that can do like more auxiliary type of stuff. It's also maybe some lessons learned from doing a covers record right before it. But on this record, rather than like one established mood, each track is given sort of an individual treatment. And I think the songs still work together well, but you get these unexpected twists and turns. Um, You've got that really cool like reverse drum effect on Peekaboo. That song also has a really cool accordion break on it, which is pretty interesting. I like a lot of the accordion work that comes in on these uh, last couple of records. Lots of auxiliary percussion on the Killing Jar, which I think is an incredible tune. Susie on that track just seems to be in full control, just commanding the band. She's almost like a conductor, it seems like, on that track. They're just like watching her and following her lead and just like really locked in with her vocals more than anything. She's able to go from something like really forceful on that track to something like uh, Carousel, which is far more reserved, more um, laid back, I guess. Um, She's also found a much more pointed and nasally tonality I think, which really became apparent on this record, but it just gives her like this other variation or other voice to go to, which is really cool. Throughout basically the rest of the catalog up to this point, she's just like doing a lot of this like guttural singing from her diaphragm really deep. She starts singing up from her head a little more on these records and uh, she can kind of go back and forth, uh, which is great. Uh, You can hear that a lot on the track Burn Up, which is really cool. Seems to be inspired by the alt country and cowpunk of the mid to late 80s. The guitar on this record, I don't think is as prominent as it usually is on uh, Susie and the Banshee records. Uh, But John Klein, I think, does a good job of filling just like a a specific role. Um, He kind of settles into the mix a little more than their previous guitarists. But still finds ways to keep things interesting. He does like this almost flamenco inspired stuff on Turn to Stone. His parts on the Killing Jar are perfect. Just these like repeating arpeggios that he's playing. Uh, The Last Beat of My Heart, I think is another great tune. Really big, epic. It's got these rolling uh, tom parts that just go through the whole song and just kind of, the song kind of swells around the drums, which is really cool. Um, I think the accordion is used to great effect on that track. Uh, Really cool song. I like this record a lot. Four stars for Peep Show. All right, let's get to the winner. If you've been keeping score at home, or even if you're by yourself, it's a Keith Olbermann line. Uh, the winner for me, A Kiss in the Dream House. This one just flew up at the last minute, surpassed Tinderbox. And I don't, I mean, I don't know why it's back in 1982. So it's after Juju, which I thought they took a huge step forward in. Um, And I think on this one, they just take all of the stuff that they had done really well and just make it a little bit better. I think the hooks, the songwriting is great. You have production, I think, puts Susie even more prominent in the mix. Uh, So it's a little more poppy sounding than Juju. There's just a lot of variety in the sound. Uh, you get that like sexy uh, melt 
get the lounge jazz of Cocoon. Uh, you got some driving alt rockers uh, like Painted Bird. And you have like one of those dance, forced dance numbers, uh, slow dive, which I don't love, but uh, I don't mind the, you know, the dancey, you know, do this, put blah, 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 uh, direction of slow dive on this. And I think it starts out, uh, there's a, a great dark mood to cascade. Uh, the arrangement of all the instruments is great. I like the fact that they brought on um, some cello players for this, a violin. Uh, so there's some nice strings on here. There's a really cool uh, organ on Painted Bird. Uh, I really like the recorder on Green Fingers. I think it's a really cool, uh, like trippy, mystical, psychedelic sound added to that. Uh, good bass playing on there and some really great chord work from McGeoch, who I think maybe not quite as good uh, as Spellbounder Into the Light, but I think as a whole, uh, really good guitar work all over this album. Obsession, uh, cool lyrics, reminds me a lot of um, like Intruder and uh, the stuff that Peter Gabriel and, and Phil Collins were doing. Uh, it's got like that heavy breathing and just really, um, you know, you got those obsessive lyrics that uh, paint the narrator in this dark light, which is cool. I like when they do that. Uh, she's a carnival, love, uh, just a ton of energy, really great drums, some pummeling bass. A circle, not my favorite. I really like the riff that they have on it, but it just like this, the, the song title says it's a circle. It just keeps going around and around and around the same thing over and over. Uh, so mm, cool two minute song that's stretched a little bit too far, five minutes for me, uh, but that doesn't totally kill the album. Melt brings it back. Uh, some really cool, I don't know if it's just a mandolin just played like legato really quickly. Uh, but it has like that classical Italian, you know, mafioso kind of sound, which is cool. Lyrically, uh, interesting, dealing simultaneously with sex and death uh, in an interesting and macabre way. And uh, Painted Bird, another good one. Cocoons, Lounge Jazz is a cool change up. And even Slow Dive, the dance song, not bad. Yeah, I just really like the direction they go with all this. I think it sounds great. I think all the instruments are great. Uh, the playing from Budgie, fantastic. McGeeock, great guitar work. Even the bass, I think, stands out on this more than at any other album. And the vocals, not quite as good as you get, but I think they are more than adequate here. So, yeah, high four stars for Kissing the Dream House. Very nice. I'm about to do my number one. I'm going 4.5 and almost five for Peep Show, my number one. I loved it. Uh, new sound with a lot more kind of synthetic touch throughout. It is like a kaleidoscope, like where everything isn't quite as it seems because it's changing right in front of your eyes. It's very cool, full of this like mind warping sensations. Killing Jar is really great. I, I like Joe's uh, Kate Bush analogy, although I don't think it really sounds like Kate Bush. I kind of think it has some of the same techniques and sensations where it's like surprisingly ornate and fierce and elegant at the same time. Um, very cool. It's just a big tapestry of like nervousness and beauty and haunting elements. Uh, Scarecrow rules, really dark and alluring. Then it gets like this march and punch to it. It's really cool. It gets great intensity at the end. Carousel, I really like. The album's just got like this gothic, ornate, side winding kind of poetry to it. That's really cool. Burn Up is like a really unique song for it that doesn't fit into the mold of everything else, but has like those big, awesome, like country shots of guitar and runaway train blues kind of feel. That's totally, it's the most surprising song in their entire catalog to me, but I think it's awesome. Turn to Stone is great. Everything's like really, really picturesque, really colorful, yet shadowy and bursting with colors. It's like a really dark heaven or like lost souls and deathly angels kind of vibe. It's, it's very cool. And it's not entirely about the aesthetic and atmosphere. Um, there's a lot of emotional enve like envelopment to it too. And the songs are just really well written. I think the last beat of my heart and others are incredibly emotional, incredibly just all encompassing artistic menagerie of mood and vibrant dark feelings with just really interesting stuff to it. It's one of the more interesting albums I've heard in the last month. I loved it. 4.5. 
always really liked it. Like it more now than ever. Peep show. Number one. All right. My number one is Superstition from 1991. This is their first time working with a different producer in quite a while. Um, Stephen Haig, as Joe mentioned, got them to the top 40 in the U.S. for the first time with Kiss Them For Me. It went to number 23. He also used computers to record the record, which they said they wanted to try something different. Ultimately, uh, Susie said she was not a fan of using computers to record And I can't imagine it would have been a fun experience to record with computers in 1991. I'm not sure if the record was fully digital or not, though. I'm I'm not exactly sure, but it definitely does have kind of a colder sound, which normally is is not a good thing for me, but I don't mind it here. I think it works for the slicker direction that they were going in. I love the vocal production on this record. I think Susie sounds great. I think it's a really, really cool flirtation with pop. The production and sounds used are extremely pop centric. Sounds kind of like Prince, like Joe said. I can hear like the divinals a little bit. Um, But I think the songs themselves are still kind of more in an alt rock vein. It's kind of like the their normal songwriting with this pop production applied to it and I could easily see like a big pop fan getting this record and feeling like they were being very edgy by by liking it when in fact it's not that far from what they would normally like but kind of being like a gateway record into cooler things for some people I think there's less standout musicianship on this record but no less enjoyable because I think it's really good ensemble playing really tightly arranged pop tunes where everyone just kind of does their part and no one shines brighter than the others. Uh, Kiss Them For Me and Shadow Time, I think are perfect pop songs. Cry is really awesome too, um, which probably has Klein's coolest guitar work on it. The only misstep on the record for me probably is the six minute track Softly, uh, which is kind of a long ambient piece with these cheesy synth pads and Susie's kind of like breathily talk singing. I guess it's kind of like meant to be sort of like a a soothing come down near the end of the record, but it just drags on way too long. Luckily though, they don't close with that and they come back strong with the ghost in you, which I think is a really great closer. Like Cram said, I just like this record a lot. I think Susie on it is just extremely charismatic. And I think she just has great melodies to work with. And she is just like in total control and sounds great. Um, So for me, I liked it the most for that. And I was like torn right between four and four and a half. And I think I'm going to go four and a half, a light four and a half for superstition. It's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that one. I I don't think I would have thought that one would be your top just because of the way it sounds like the eighties and you hate the eighties. So interesting. I'm with Joe. I definitely didn't think Joe or Jason would that one as much. But wouldn't imagine I would know which one he would like the most. So maybe the cover, maybe probably the Rapture, to be honest. Well, I like Melodies the most, and that one I think has the best of those. So there you go. Um, final thoughts on Susie. I was uh, first time through not feeling it very much, and then subsequent listens, things really kind of grew on me. And really, the back half of the catalog now I like a lot. Like Susie, like you, it took a little while to grow on me. I think the lack of strong choruses throughout, like they don't have that many catchy choruses. A lot of them seem like verse extensions. Uh, So as soon as I kind of got over that hang up and really learned to love the the instrumentation and the unique sound. um, And, you know, they were definitely ahead of their time, I think, on a lot of these, which helps. make them interesting and just a lot of cool textures cool techniques and yeah i, I dig them I, I i was a little wary the first time through like you i was just like oh i don't think i'm gonna get to four i don't even know if i'm gonna get to three and a half but yeah, they grew on me yeah overall i would say the biggest surprise was the early stuff being a lot more influential a lot more post-rock than i was aware of None of it gets bad. I think at their worst, they're still a decent, interesting act. But, you know, there's a handful of, you know, really good songs and a couple of great albums and really good albums. So, yeah, overall, 
pretty damn good experience for me. All right. So there you go. Let us know what you think of Susie and the Banshees and what you think of our lists. And let us know how you rank the records down in the comments. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you have not yet done so. Uh, hit the bell for notifications and be sure, be sure to check the video description for links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our website, our merch store, and Patreon if you'd like to support the channel further. Uh, helps us out a lot. So go check out all the links and check back tomorrow for top 10 favorite Susie and the Banshee songs. We'll see you then. <laughs>